Brian Johnson, you embody your practice. That's what I love about you. Right? No matter which way you look at what you're doing, you truly embody your practice, which I have just the utmost respect for. And I, in this video, I want to be able to talk about your protocol, what you do as far as the extreme things and maybe the less extreme to reverse your epigenetic age and, and age so slowly. But before we get into that, I have to ask, what does your daily diet look like? Yes, yeah, the way we did this is we, we try to take the approach to say, if you inquire of every organ how they're doing and ask them what they need, what, would, what response would you get? And so we endeavored to measure every organ of my body, which no one had ever done before. And we thought it was an interesting question to measure age and function by organ type, not by chronological age or you know some generic age, but every organ. And then we'd take the organ data and we'd say, what do we know about science? What does science know about nourishing this organ, about trying to cure its defects and trying to get it in a more optimal state? And then we just started working with the scientific literature and we had a framework where every calorie had to fight for its life. And so we, of course, would get forks in the road where there was more than one right answer that could satisfy the solution and we would choose one. And so now the diet is, so for breakfast I do this super veggie, it's broccoli, cauliflower, lentils, hemp seeds, garlic, and ginger. And it's a like 250 grams of broccoli, 150 grams of cauliflower. So it's a, it's a big dish. The next meal is nutty pudding, which is macadamia nuts, walnuts, flaxseed, sunflower lecithin, pomegranate juice, berries, and pea protein. And then the final meal of the day is berries, nuts, and seeds of some variety. And then I'll have a tablespoon or 15 ml of Evo of extra virgin olive oil with every mil, so 45 mLs a day. And that's about 2,250 calories. Beautiful. And then you have that into a pretty compressed eating window. Yeah, I have my, when I wake up around four or five, I'll do my first intake and then I'll finish up by about 11. After today's video, I popped the link down below for Thrive Market. Now that is an online membership-based grocery store and that is a 30% off discount link and a $60 free gift when you use that special link down below. So think about being able to walk into a grocery store and immediately narrow down what you want. You want sugar-free, you want high protein, you want this, you can use these filters and shop for whatever you want. Plus, I also have my own signature products that I've created with Thrive Market. I've created some low-carb keto truffles that are sweetened with allulose. I've created nut butters that are sweetened with allulose, so like these dessert butters. I've linked out to them down below as well. But you can also just go to Thrive Market and you can search for like uh, Thomas DeLauer nut butter or Thomas DeLauer low-carb truffles, whatever. Anyhow, that link down below saves you 30% off your entire first grocery order and a free $60 gift. So if you're shopping, you're getting groceries for yourself, you've got to check them out. And they've been a big supporter of this channel for over half a decade. So thank you to them and thank you to you. Okay, so you're doing more of an early time restricted feeding. Mm -hmm. Great. So you've noticed a pretty big difference in your sleep optimization with that? Entirely. That's, yeah. that's the sole reason why I do it. That if I, I know if I can get my resting heart rate to like 47 or 46 right before I go to bed, I'm almost guaranteed a perfect night's sleep. Really? But if my resting heart rate is 51 or 54 or 57, it's I'm in dangerous territory. It's like that tight. So is it mainly, do you notice it mainly with sleep onset or do you notice it with uh, just your overall sleep wake cycles overall? Yeah, sleep onset is always good. It's okay. always like one to four minutes. So it's always perfect. Uh, but it's REM and deep, which take the hit. Yeah. Do you notice that you are that you wake easier? Like, uh, for example, you have to pee in the night, or so. I'm sure you regulate that too, because that's a big thing for me. If I drink too close to bedtime, if I pee, it's game over. Yeah, <laughs> it's so true. Like when you're when you're playing in like the upper echelon of sleep performance, you get to a point where the the slightest deviations of habit have these huge effects. And so like you're saying, like you wake up and then you're dead. Yep. <laughs> you, yep. know, you can't get back. I don't have that particular problem, but I understand the situation. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's why like once you, and then if you have one bad night's sleep, I feel so terrible and my mood is off. Mm -hmm. I feel grumpy, you know, like life does not seem as glimmering as it used to. And so it's hard to go from that ideal state to just dip one night. Uh, I know that like what I can imagine once you get lower, you normalize to that situation, you just get a blurred sense, you kind of forget it. Mm -hmm. But that shock is, is it keeps me 
pretty tight of not wanting to deviate because it's just so nice to have great sleep. Yeah. So what time are you, what time are you going to bed? 8.30. Okay. So it's on the nose. Yeah. yeah. So with that, uh, I'm curious, what does your, what do your REM phases look like? How much, how many minutes of REM are you getting? I'm kind of curious with someone that's got it nailed so well, because you see all these different recommendations. Oh, here's what your REM should be. Here's, mm. uh, have you seen much deviation or is your REM pretty much solid across the board, almost the same every night? Pretty consistent. Yeah. Two and a half, two and a half, two and a half REM, two and a half deep. Nice. And you'll notice, does that change if for any reason, I know you regulate how much light exposure you get and whatnot, but if that does change for any reason, you say, okay, I got double the sun exposure that I would have gotten today or double the light exposure. Do you notice a change in your REM or does it not seem to reflect there? It's mostly mood, I'm sorry, mostly food and stress. Yeah. That if I have a late meal or a heavy meal or I deviate from my protocol and I have like uh, carbs, like breads or pastas, that will hit deep. I'll spend more time potentially in the same time in REM, but mostly in light yeah. and dip in deep. And then on mood, uh, if I go to bed stressed, then I will spend the majority of my time in light and I'll miss both REM and deep. That's a good segue to that because I mean, it's not like you live this super fluffy lifestyle where you don't have stress. I mean, you still are running businesses, you still have stress, mm -hmm. right? So, and that's such a variable that's hard to control. Yeah. And I think this speaks to the layperson as well. I mean, it's just, are there things that you do as sort of a, a stopgap or like if you start saying, okay, I'm having a stressful situation, that today's a stressful day, it'd be easy to send that into a stress spiral where, yeah. well, now, now my sleep optimization, I mean, I'll do that, right? You know, get stressed out and then get stressed out about how that's gonna impact my sleep optimization <laughs> yeah. and then it's just game over. Yeah. So are there, do you have things to mitigate that when you say, uh oh, here it's coming? I do this trick where I treat myself as various forms of Brian. And so there's like evening Brian, when he was prone to overeating. So 7 p.m. would come and he just wanted to make himself sick by overeating. You know, I had to like step in and intervene in that situation. And I call this situation when I go to bed, uh, nighttime Brian. So if I'm in my 30 to 60 minute wind down time before bed and an incoming thought is something like, uh, we're stressed out about this thing at work or we're upset about this interaction or I wish I wouldn't have said this given thing or like, you know, all the things you're doing at tail end of, ruminating on the day, like beating yourself up and or making observations and or making plans, like all the things we do. I'll intercept a thought and say, this is, this is uh, sleep Brian speaking. <laughs> Thank you for your suggestion. We are now in sleep mode. We have all day tomorrow to address this topic. Right now we're in sleep. And it's the explicit conversation I have with myself of like ambitious Brian or problem solving problem or Brian or whoever's trying to speak to acknowledge their presence and then accept the, the thought and then just say, we're not going to deal with it right now. And I, I've learned that I have to treat myself as separate Brian's because otherwise it just gets all mixed up. Cause then the thought comes in, it's like, I'm worried or I'm stressed or I'm mad or whatever. You can't just push it away. Like it just, it yeah. sticks. <laughs> and then you ruminate because it sticks, you try to get rid of it, it still sticks. And so I figured you had to come up with a methodical process to soothe and talk to self. Yeah, you've gamified mindfulness in a completely different way. Yeah, it's yeah. Like almost a visualizing, like giving yourself a, like a kinesthetic awareness of it. You're like, okay, I am physically, I am embodying nighttime Brian now, and yeah. it's easy to just let it bounce off of you. That's right. Yeah, and you're like respecting, like you're like problem solving Brian. He legit has good intentions. Yeah. And so like you're thanking him for what he's trying to do in life. I love that. I'm gonna adopt <laughs> that. Yeah, because that's yeah. definitely that's a very real thing. Yeah. Uh, before we get into your your protocol or your sort of different things that you do there. I'm curious about hydration because this is such a difficult thing to manage. Yeah. What do you do for hydration? Because it's such a big piece of just age in general. Yeah, we dry out. Right? Yeah. Like by the time we get old, we're substantially less uh, than we were as babies. Uh, I try to consume around 60 to 100 ounces of water a day and all before roughly 4 p.m. So is there any always going to be between that 60 and 100. I mean, do you account for humidity? Do you get down to pressure? Do you get down to that level or are you not too concerned with that? We, uh, so we started measuring hydration. We were doing this therapy and what the, the therapy had a device that would attach to your skin and measure hydration okay. because measuring hydration is hard. Yeah. And like, you can't just do it on a scale. It gives you some number, but we wanted a higher degree of accuracy. And so we started building models of where my hydration was throughout various parts of the day, just to get a rough idea of where that was. And then we started mineralizing all my water. So either a tea or electrolytes, like something to mineralize to help the absorption. And we found that uh, between 60 and 100, basically 
no matter how much I was working out or whatever the routines, it was roughly kept me in the hydration level. Nice. So we didn't feel like it needed a deep dive of uh, tremendous scrutiny, yeah. like the approximate rules for working to keep me hydrated and to avoid what we were talking about, uh, which is trying to get up, you know, getting up at night to go to the bathroom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, I've definitely found personally with hydration, it's just as easy, at least if you're on top of your game, it's just as easy to overhydrate as it is to underhydrate yes. and demineralize yourself and completely you know, dilute, which I notice at least in, in athletics, I mean, I, I cramp more when I drink more water, but drinking more yes. water for Thomas is like a lot more water than what maybe a regular person would yeah. do, right? So it's like, if I'm in a hyperhydrate, I might be drinking way too much and then I'm completely devoid of the important minerals. Yes, um, exactly right. Moving into sort of protocol, I mean, if we start like, what's the most grandiose thing that you do on a daily basis? Maybe something that, or actually it doesn't have to be on a daily basis. Like people are always intrigued by, you know, with all due respect, the amount of money you might spend on something mm -hmm. for for longevity and for reversing epigenetic age. What's the most grandiose thing that you've spent money on for, for this? Yeah, it's so this project is not expensive to do, it's expensive to measure. Mm -hmm. That was the whole thing. So it's not two million years into my body, two million dollars a year in my body. It's that we spent the money, what we did that was unique is we we evaluated all the scientific literature on health span and lifespan. Like we combed through everything. We ranked everything according to the most uh, powerful effects. We graded the evidence. And then we took those power laws and we said, what if you put them all inside of me? And then we measured me extensively. That's expensive. It was really hard to do. And so that's where the majority of the money has gone is the research, the team of doctors, there's been 30 people on, on the team, and then figuring out how to do esoteric therapies. Um, so, but really the basics of Blueprint, most people can do what I've done and get the power laws for 1000 to 1500 a month, which includes groceries. Wow. So it's very, very cheap. And so there's just this misconception. But yeah. so the craziest thing we've done is we tried to take into account all the science that Homo sapiens as a species has ever generated on health. And we tried to basically organize it and put it into power rankings. So how's that looking? <laughs> so there, there's uh, basically five, let's call it six categories. Yeah. Uh, one, don't smoke and you get 12 years. Uh, exercise is number two, six hours a week. Three is a Mediterranean or blueprint-like diet. Four is BMI, 18.5 to 22.5 with the asterisks of BMI. Yeah. Uh, five is a moderate to zero alcohol consumption. Mm -hmm. And then six is sleep. Mm -hmm. And if you nail those things consistently, you can get to an estimated life ex uh, expectancy of 92. Interesting. So, so each one of those categories is slightly weighed a little bit different, I would imagine. Yes. So if you uh, go over on the exercise category, for example, go more than six hours, does it have a deleterious effect on your overall score? I think it does. I am not familiar with that literature. I think I, when we were going over this, that yes, like it's yeah. not too much, not too little, but just right. And when I think when you look at the evidence, there's not a particular kind of exercise that's recommended. Like you can do zone two and things mm -hmm. like that. but if you're debating between the various kinds of things one can do, it's generally okay to do all of them yeah. so long as you're getting your rough numbers in. Yeah, that's kind of what I've found as well too. Yeah. Even if you get into the extremes of it, you have you know these loud camps that'll say it's VO2 max, loud camps that'll say it's zone two, loud camps that'll say it's resistance only. Yes. It's almost like, okay, maybe maybe rotate through all of them or because at the end of the day, it doesn't seem like one is particularly yeah. stronger than the other. There might be more money poured into literature on one side, but if you actually look at the yeah. numbers, it's like, this is kind of even across the board. Yeah. Do you do much as far as light is concerned? Red light therapy, do you mess around with any kind of UVB or UVA, like particular uh, you know, indoor lights to manipulate that? Yeah, when I wake, I do 10,000 lux, because I wake up before the sun rises. So I do 10,000 lux in the eye for a few minutes, uh, right when I wake up, and then I have blue light blocking on my computer. So I try to avoid blue light altogether. I think there's some evidence that some is good for you. I just do it all. I miss it. I don't like the bright screens. Mm -hmm. um, I do red light therapy, which is red and near infrared three mm -hmm. times a week for 12 minutes. Yeah. I think it's like, a, it's not a power law. It's okay, but it's right there on the border on whether it justifies time. Like when, yeah. when you can do so many things, uh, we have to stack rank it and say, is it worth doing this given thing? 
I'm not sure red light is really a powerful player. It's, it's something we do, but yeah. And then, uh, yeah, nighttime routines, like blue light blocking glasses. I try to avoid screen time uh, before bed, stuff like that. So like right now we've got some lights on us and I was kind of thinking about it and we were setting them up. I'm like, yeah. are you gonna adjust for being exposed to some additional light or is, like, do you do, uh, make an adjustment based on that? I've never noticed a difference. So yeah. if there has been, and I haven't noticed it. Yeah. yeah, then I try to, I do sun exposure in the morning before nine or 10 a.m. and then after five or 6 p.m. And do you find, I mean, here, in California, we might get a marine layer in the summer that makes it a little bit, so the, the morning sunlight that you get might be a little bit different. Do you adjust your time? You, do you measure the lux outside? Like, hey, it's okay, it's super sunny today. It might be completely different than if it's socked in with fog, do you stay out a little bit longer? Yeah, I watch UV index. Okay. So when the UV index gets to a, a damaging place, I just avoid the sun altogether. Or I'll have an umbrella or something like that. So we've been trying to quantify skin age. I, I grew up in the sun. Like we were in the sun all the time. Mm -hmm. We never wore sunscreen. So when I started this project and we started doing these measurements, my skin was just awful. <laughs> like it was like 60 plus year old on like UV damage and stuff like that. So we've had to, a lot of work to do to try and get my skin back even to like basic level. Like the thing about Blueprint that was so crazy to me is I grew up eating sugar cereal and drinking soda. Like that was just part of the culture. We ate processed foods the whole entire time. I never ate vegetables. Uh, I was in the sun the entire time. I was in, I was an entrepreneur for 20 years doing grind culture, like not sleeping, eating terrible foods. I was chronically depressed for a decade. So I, mean, I came to this project never in my entire life having taken care of my health. I was just in a really bad spot. And so for us to even be in an okay spot right now to me is phenomenal. And that's a, a lot of people, of course, they, they look at me now and they don't have any context or background on where I was or where I came from, what we've achieved. But yeah. That's been the coolest thing for me is like the science works. Yeah. And uh, I, it's made me so bullish on this field. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think it's so easy for people to take one piece of it, look at it, say that's extreme, and just accept that all of it's going to be extreme and that this is not worth it. It's flat out not worth it. And I think they think that it has to be this massive investment in money and time to do these little things. And although you are an example of someone that's truly embodying this and doing this, it's a little bit goes a long way in doing mm -hmm. these things too. And I mean, with that, I mean, an example, I'm curious your cold plunge, your heat routine. I mean, are you doing, I've seen some stuff that you did with like Ben Patrick there. Are, are you still doing any of that? Uh, I don't do any cold therapy no. or sauna. And not that they're not beneficial. Mm -hmm. uh, they have their benefits. They just didn't fit into the power laws of our longevity. Yeah. And so my very narrow objective is longevity. And so if you want to expand into other things, you know, they definitely have their place, but we've just been very focused because once you throw in the possibility set of anything and everything you can do for health and wellness, there's hundreds of things to do. Yeah. And you have to have some kind of sorting mechanism to say yes or no to a given thing. Well, that's, I mean, that's exactly, I guess, proves my point there. It's like people think they have to do all of yeah. that, right? And it's, most people would look at, at cold plunge or sauna and they say, okay, well, that's the biggest lever that I can pull. And I mean, Clearly, well, maybe it's not for you. Maybe it is for somebody else. But at the end of the day, clearly that's not making the cut for you. I like that you look at it from a time efficiency standpoint. Yeah. Do you look at your levels of, of ROS or your antioxidant capacity? I mean, do you measure those kinds of things? Because I would imagine there's certain things that are, if it's too much stress, it's going to drive down your antioxidant capacity. It's going to make things worse. Yeah. You know, um, I did get measured once for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, I scored well, uh, but I've my team and I have not talked about that as a marker. I don't know why. No. Um, and so I guess like the process is the team I work with will raise will raise a given topic like um, the Ross, mm -hmm. and then it's like you have all these ways of of discussing that topic, whether it's beneficial or not, mm -hmm. what you can do about it, and what you should do about it. But it branches off into so much complexity, and clearly all of us want a simple answer. Is it good? Is it bad? What do you do to make it better or worse? <laughs> like, and oftentimes we found that it's so much more nuanced than that. And so I, with that given topic, I'm not sure where we're at as a team. I know we've measured it once, but it's not something we routinely, routinely measure. I don't know why. Probably, I mean, it changes rapidly, right? I mean, it's like if you mm -hmm. were to jump in a cold plunge, uh, I think it would change. And I think, and I may be mistaken, I mean, to really do it accurately, I mean, you have, it's almost localized to specific areas. Mm. You, know, you can measure uh, antioxidant capacity in a given muscle that you've just trained and kind of yeah. your uh, ability to reduce and kind of 
we're looking at sort of these precursors even. So they'll do biopsies of the quadriceps to look at taurine levels as mm. a marker for antioxidant activity. So I'd imagine it'd be almost impossible to triangulate what's actually making the biggest difference in your life, you know, yeah. or driving just the right amount of stress. Because I'd imagine with, with the amount of fasting that you're doing with your time-restricted eating, you're generating just enough reactive oxygen species to make you stronger and mm. you're probably right at the tip of where you need to be. Otherwise, I'd imagine your team is saying, hey, we need to reel this back. Or, yeah. You know. Yeah. And I guess like I, into your question, I try to eagerly acknowledge what I don't know as much as I would acknowledge what I think I know. Yeah. Because it's health and wellness is such a difficult place to hang out when you have everyone talking about their various things, everyone disagrees. Yep. And even like foremost authorities in every area, you never get consensus. And so for someone who's not competing in the foremost authority category, what are they left to do other than like, yeah. I have no idea now what to do, like these basic things in my life. and so. Uh, I do try to eagerly step into what I don't know, including ROS. And so we try to say of the markers we can identify that we do have evidence to say this marker matters for the following reasons. We try to peg those markers and say, let's nail those. And then these others that are in the periphery around it, as they emerge with more evidence, we'll incorporate them. But we try to base on ourselves to say, are we saying on what we're doing by these, fo these foundational markers we think are solid to track? What would you say the most important markers, at least to you, are? Not maybe not necessarily. Maybe I'm sure your team probably looks at things that might be a little more intricate than maybe float to the top for you. But what would you say the top three or four markers that you mm -hmm. look at that you pay attention to are? I mean, basic ones like inflammation. Yeah. I don't think there's a. Uh, okay, let me <laughs> let me be careful on this. Um, yeah, excessive inflammation is probably considered to be bad. Yeah and low inflammation is probably considered good. Mm -hmm. And there's probably some disagreement on how much, you know, is some inflammation good, is zero inflammation yeah. bad? So like there's probably some disagreement in the, the more narrow category, but inflammation's one. And then uh, blood markers, I think a lot of people will say are good. Like if you take um, blood glucose, mm -hmm. like that's something that you should have pegged. I don't think there's a ton of disagreement, people saying that you should be at 150 or 160 because it's better. Yeah. So there's a few areas of science that are settled of yeah, blood glucose, inflammation. Um, I think cholesterol doesn't fall in that category. I think people disagree about yeah. a lot of cholesterol, mm -hmm. so I wouldn't put that in there. You know, like white blood cells, red blood cells, like yeah. basic biochemistry of the body. So there's sure. like some good stuff in the, in the blood. And it's kind of funny when you actually get down to it like that and you're like, well, what's the most important? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're like, well, shoot, no, well, that seems important, but it's actually not yeah. really clear. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's nothing that I would consider to be, you know, considerate evidence to really say yes or no. Yes. You know, it's kind of funny. The cholesterol discussion is such an interesting one because it's like the literature, although I don't want to necessarily say it's split 50-50, it's split enough that yes. it's all debatable. Yes. It's all really e debatable. Exactly right. Yeah. So we've, like, this is what I've tried to do. I've tried to provide one data point or one example of someone trying to clean up the conversation. Yeah. And so if somebody wants to get into health and wellness and they say, okay, I'm in, what do I do? I've tried to say, okay, here's what I eat, here's the food I eat, here are the pills I take, here's the exercise I do. Not saying that any of that is the best or the only thing. It's just like, it's what I've done. And it's produced, you know, let's say, my top 1.5% of 18 year olds of VO2 max, my 99.8 percentile total bone mineral density, like you have all these markers that put me in like the top percentiles for 18 year olds. It's like, we're okay. Like we're doing something well to some degree. And I've tried to just provide one option for some people to say, all right, like maybe this can be improved or maybe people are going to disagree about this or that, but at least I've got a stable place to step into to start. What was the first thing that you changed? Like when you embarked on this journey, you're like, what was the first thing you said? Okay, I'm diving into this what is step one? Yeah, it was the whole idea that everything can be connected to a bio age marker. So your WASO, like your head hits a pillow, the time it takes for you to fall asleep is an age marker. Hmm. And so you want to be, I think if I remember correctly, under four minutes is ideal. Yeah. And then, um, oh, I'm sorry, I said WASO, I meant to say sleep onset. Yeah. Your, your sleep onset, you want to be under four minutes, but then your WASO, your awake after sleep onset, how much you're up for the night, that is an age marker. And so you want to be under 30 minutes. 
And as you age, when you see people in their 60s, 70s, or those with poor sleep, they'll sometimes be in the two hour range. And so I would find that everywhere I went, whether it was looking at the gums in my mouth or my sleep onset or wake after sleep onset, uh, my, how far I could run in 12 minutes, my diaphragm strength, my eyesight, my hearing, like everything had an age. And that was cool that I could begin to speak the language of bioage and realize what aging processes had happened to which organs. That's interesting. I mean, it seems as though a lot of these roads are coming back to, to sleep as yeah. being one of the biggest things. If not, I mean, I don't know, I might even go on record and say it's probably the biggest thing as far as yeah how we live our daily lives, right? I mean, of course, nutrition, sunlight, all these things are important, but it's such a, a clear indicator. And I don't think people realize that their duration of sleep tends to decrease as they mm -hmm. get older. Yeah. And I don't particularly know why. I'm not sure if you know why outside of just life stress, but that wouldn't explain why someone that's maybe retired in their 70s or 80s without a lot of uh, you know real stress coming in from the financial world per se, why their sleep was to continue to, to yeah. excuse me to diminish. Yeah, like one thing that like they it's I think theorized that the pineal gland, you know, helps with melatonin and uh, with sleep, and over time it calcifies, mm. and so it loses its function. So right now we're talking to a researcher who has this novel uh, ultrasound technology, like using ultrasound to decalcify the pineal gland hmm. that could potentially improve sleep. And so I've done one session so far where doing a few more sessions, but that's one, theorization, that's one theory on how to rebuild sleep strength, because in time, your biological systems just aren't as good at uh, having you fall asleep and stay asleep. And then you have competing systems where if your prostate enlarges, now it's pushing on the bladder and now you have to pee more often. So now you're up to pee, you can't get back down, you can't go back to sleep. And so your body's just falling apart and it becomes harder and harder for basic biological functions that happen like sleep. I wonder if the calcification of the pineal gland is sometimes accelerated in people with more stress or yeah. if it's one of these things, or if it's an interesting feedback system where a lot of stress causes X, Y, Z, so then they don't sleep as much because of a period of stress. So there becomes a little bit more calcification that occurs here or the neuroinflammation that's triggering this. Yeah. I wonder if there's ever going to be any literature that comes out that kind of reverse engineers why that could be happening and why some people might start to experience that earlier yeah. in life rather than later. This is the cool thing with where we're at in the world right now is the technology we have to measure allows us to probe our body parts, our pineal glands, our heart, our lungs, and we can then start saying things with much greater precision. This diet does this thing, or this sleep routine does this thing, or this therapy does that thing. And then, then we can get out of this these abstract zones where we make a given statement and it's so broad and abstract and varied to people, it's almost meaningless to the population. But that's where we're at kind of, it's okay, like we're at a stage of health and wellness that we are, but I think the future is so promising because I think we will narrow down and it'll be much less guesswork and much more, more knowledge. And we just say like, we know these given things, build the systems to make these uh, autonomous. So I, I'm really bullish about the field. Yeah, agreed. And, and you know, in this segment, I wanna wrap up with your supplement regime. Yeah. What does a day of supplementation look like for you? It used to be 111. That was at the peak. And wow. now we're down to like 40 something, 42. Did, and it, did it decrease because you got to a point of being healthy enough or you've achieved the result where you're like, I don't need these anymore? Or has it just been a distillation process of understanding what's most important? Yeah, we, with Blueprint, so we, we started taking all these pills. We wanted to have control over the manufacturing process because uh, once you dig into the world of food and supplements, <laughs> it's like working in the back room of a kitchen. <laughs> like once, you, once you're at the restaurant, you work in the back room, you're never again going to eat the food. Yeah, yeah. And so the same thing, like once I got into started looking at food and supplements, I thought, no way am I trusting the system because food is so dirty and supplements are the same. Like it's really dangerous. And Arguably so, even dirtier. Even dirtier. <laughs> yeah. And people like make this assumption that, oh, like, surely we're in the US or like somewhere, you know, in some modern society, somebody is watching out for us, but that's not true. This, the stuff that slips by is pretty egregious. And so we basically took control of that and started doing all of our own stuff. We still use a few people for a few things that we didn't get in supplementation form, but we dramatically minimized. So like I was doing blueprint, uh, I was basically trying to secure my own food for 
health reasons. And then I became aware of the food system. And then I started running away from the food system to Blueprint because I came a little, came a little scared of, of the dirtiness. And so it's been an interesting thing to see both sides of it. So yeah, like 42 because we built our own stuff. What would you say if you had to put your finger on the most important one? What would you say the most important one for you is? It doesn't mm. have to be for everybody else. Mm. I jokingly say that extra virgin olive oil is better than NR, NMN, resveratrol, hmm. um, cold plunge sauna, and your favorite podcast. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, it's just good. It's yeah. good uh, across whole body. And, um, but it's like, I say it tongue in cheek, kind of, yeah. but yeah, I'd say Evo for me. Um, and I use that, I use food instead of a supplement, but I say food because uh, I use that one thing. because I think it probably has the highest impact in the body. Do you think, is it, is it because of the uh, polyphenol content or is it more so because of the monounsaturated fats or is it just a collection of the multiple different benefits of olive oil that you would say the all most of it yeah. yeah i mean like if i tried to identify a supplement you know i could say something like uh calcium alpha ketoglutarate or i could say fisetin or i could say lutolian or you know like yeah. they all have a very narrow vector for sure and they all do a good job and collectively they do a great job yeah i guess i if i'm trying to find like the most all-encompassing thing that adds the most cumulative value i don't know i mean maybe i'm wrong maybe it's something like pomegranate juice but I'm guessing Evo. Yeah, well, I mean, you're looking, if you're factoring blood glucose into the equation, all these other, like, right, there's other like, factors that are gonna diminish the value yeah. based on potential downsides yeah. as well, so. I mean, Evo, if you take, um, when you eat food, oxidative stress, oxidative, oxidative damage happens. Mm -hmm. So with Evo, your, it reduces oxidized LDL by like 90%. It reduces LDL by 80%. It reduces blood glucose, I think by 60%, mm -hmm. if I remember those numbers correctly. But it has a dramatic neutralizing effect on damage you'd otherwise have when you eat. And so it also has a lot of protective mechanisms in addition to the benefits. Now, given the fact that, I mean, you're cutting off eating around 11 a.m. or so, and then going a vast majority of the day without food, you still train, you're probably decently active. Are you measuring ketone levels at all? Because the diet that you mentioned to me didn't seem exceptionally carbohydrate heavy. Yeah, I did initially, I yeah. haven't for a while. What, what would be your guess? I'd be curious. I would imagine just given, I mean, because you're, you have a fair bit of lean body mass. It's not like you're super skinny. I mean, you're not over the top muscular, but like when I saw you in person, like literally it's like, oh, wow, you're way more jacked than I thought. Mm. So just given the amount of muscle mass that you have, I wouldn't be surprised if you're registering at half a millimolar ketones by the end of the day, mm. depending on just how active you are throughout the rest of the day. Yeah. Because like I speak for myself, I will have between 100 and 120 grams of carbs a day. And granted, I'm a bigger dude, but I, and I train pretty hard, but I'm producing between half and one millimole of ketones still by the end of the day, mm, um, mm. even at that on a heavy training day. Mm. And if I'm fasting for typically like 18 hours, a couple of days a week, when I do 18 to 20 hour fasts, like two days a week, by the end of those fasts, I'm clear above one. Mm. So it's very easy for my body to be producing ketones, which I think is a sign of, to sound cheeky at the risk of sounding, you know, like a, a term that's not exactly scientific, being metabolically flexible, right? Being yeah. able to switch back and forth and produce ketones effectively, quickly, and transition to that mm. when it's time. Mm. You know, I think that metabolic instability happens when people are so programmed, just consistently fueling all the time that they're never yeah. even getting a chance to even have a remote opportunity to produce ketones. Yeah, I'll measure, I'm curious. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I would imagine, because I'd love to factor that into you know, there's so many anti-inflammatory benefits for registering, even down to when people are exercising and they're producing ketones yeah. while they're exercising, are there cardiometabolically protective benefits mm -hmm. for producing these ketones? There's certainly anti-inflammatory effects is one of the benefits of exercise and longer duration exercise, the circulating levels of ketones that could yeah. be present, right? Yeah. And just because ketones are present doesn't mean that glucose isn't present. I think yeah. that's the common misconception, at least yeah. to the mainstream. It's like you're you're dipping to a point where, okay, now the body's going to start releasing these. Yeah. And I think the regular endurance athlete, they're getting into ketosis almost every time they train, at least mm. for a little while. Mm. So yeah, it would be definitely interesting to look at. Yeah. We, as a, like a general mindset, we're open to everything all the time. So we'd love to learn. We'd love to measure. Uh, we'd love to find out where we're, where we're wrong. So yeah, like just as a general disposition, we try, we are not tribal. We do not try to start war. <laughs> like if people are branched to different areas, great. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, so all that is welcome. And I'd love to measure it and see where I'm at. Perfect. Well, Brian, where can everyone find you? Where can they find your products? Where can they find their, your olive oil? Uh, Blueprint.brianjohnson.com. 
Perfect. And then my protocol is protocol.brianjohnson.com. And that's where I have everything that's available for free. Perfect. Thanks, Brian. Yeah.